Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to session number 15830, Meeting People Where They Are, Treating HIV, HCV, SUD, and Injection Drug Use. We have an engaging panel planned for you today, and our goal is for you to take away at least one key piece of actionable information back to your program, given just how serious the intersection is between HIV, hepatitis C, substance use disorder, and injection drug use. One of today's presenters has a relevant financial or non-financial interest to disclose. Dr. Truskin does receive grant research support from Gilead Sciences, and she's a member of the advisory board for Gilead Sciences. And a disclosure will be made when a product is discussed for unapproved use. At the conclusion of this activity, participants will be able to describe the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases, or AASLD, and Infectious Disease Society of America, or IDSA, their treatment recommendations for hepatitis C. Participants will also be able to describe how to make referrals to effective harm reduction services, describe effective linkage to care models for people co-infected with HIV and hepatitis C, and understand where to locate additional resources related to treating hepatitis C among people with substance use disorder who inject drugs. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Stacy Truskin, Chief Medical Officer and Director of Viral Hepatitis Programs at the Philadelphia Fight Community Health Centers and faculty at the University of Pennsylvania's Perelman School of Medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Truskin. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. Um, I'd like to get started. Next slide, please. Great. These are my disclosures. So I'd like to provide everybody with a little bit of background today and start off with an overview of hepatitis C and the opioid epidemic. Really, we have what has been described as a syndemic or two epidemics that are closely intertwined. We know that the hepatitis C antibody prevalence among people who inject drugs is anywhere between 70 to 77%. And that one out of three people who inject drugs will acquire hepatitis C infection in their first year of injecting. Unfortunately, roughly half to 75, 85% of individuals who are chronically infected with hepatitis C remain unaware of their status. Next slide. The epidemiology of hepatitis C has largely changed because of the opioid epidemic. We've seen significant increases in acute hepatitis C rates. Um, and you can see in the graph uh, that, that is up on the slide here, that particularly among individuals who are younger, 20 to 29 years of age, 30 to 39 years of age, the, the rates per 100,000 of acute HCV have gone up considerably. Um, we've seen a 3.5-fold increase in new cases since 2010, and most newly acquired cases are young, white people who inject drugs who are living in non-urban areas. Although as somebody who lives in an urban area, our communities are impacted as well. Next slide. In response to the changing epidemiology, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the ASLD and IDSA, that's the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease and Infectious Disease Society of America, have really changed how we screen for hepatitis C in the United States. You may remember that hepatitis C was, um, screening was recommended for people who were in the birth cohort of the baby boomer, so individuals born between 1945 and 1965. But now, because of the opioid epidemic, our, our epidemiology has shifted to a significantly younger population. As you can see from this graph, there's a bimodal distribution now um, where we have an equal number of younger people who are impacted by hepatitis C as there are older. And as a result, the recommendations for screening have changed. Um, and have moved away from just birth cohort-based testing to engage our baby boomers, now to universal screening for hepatitis C infection with adults aged 18 to 79 years of age 
should be screened um, at least once in their lifetime. And obviously we should be screening much more frequently for individuals who have a known ongoing risk factor or for whom a risk factor is, is assessed, like people who inject drugs. This USPSTF recommendation has been given a grade B, which allows this to be reimbursable. So all persons with risk factors, so um, people who have received blood transfusions before 1992, people who inject drugs, um, individuals who were born to a mother with a, a risk factor, should be tested for hepatitis C with periodic testing while risk factors persist. Next slide, please. So these are those ASLD IVSA recommendations that are really specific to people who inject drugs. Here you'll see that annual HCV testing is recommended for people who inject drugs who have not had prior testing or past negative testing and subsequent injection drug use. And then depending on the level of risk, more frequent testing may be indicated. We now have moved to a place where treatment is recommended for individuals even with acute infection. For those of you who may be familiar with the old paradigm of treating hepatitis C, we would wait for somebody to see if they cleared the infection for six to 12 months before engaging them in, um, in treatment for hepatitis C when we were using very toxic medications like interferon-based treatment. Now that treatment is so much easier, we treat acute infection as well with the idea that treatment is also prevention of transmission. And so that's where the more frequent testing may be indicated so we can catch a new infection in, in, in an individual who may be engaging in high-risk activity and is at risk for transmitting to other people. Now, at least annual HCV RNA testing is recommended for people who inject drugs with recent injection drug use after they have either cleared hepatitis C infection or have been successfully treated. So we know that antibody to hepatitis C is a measure of prior exposure, and it will stick around even after the virus has been cleared or cured. And therefore, screening with RNA testing is the recommendation for people who have either cleared or cured in the past. Next slide, please. So part of the major concern around injection drug use and substance use disorder is that hepatitis C can survive for a long time outside the body. So it can survive in a syringe for up to 64 days, um, in a water container for 21 days and surfaces for 21 days. And this is particularly important um, when we consider the way that an injection is prepared when somebody is using drugs. Often the drugs are taken, they're dissolved in a solvent, which is usually something like water. And if somebody has put their syringe into somebody else's, let's say, bottle of Poland Springs, and then pulls up in that syringe some of that water to then prepare their, their drugs for injection, that water is contaminated uh, with hepatitis C. And similarly, either reusing or sharing syringes could be a problem for the, the, the same reason. So this highlights the importance of um, harm reduction programs where, where syringe service programs allow individuals who are not ready to um, stop injecting to do so as safely as possible. We know that hepatitis C survives at high temperatures, um, particularly on the East Coast. Uh, things like heroin are not usually heated, um, but on the West Coast where, they, where heroin may be heated, even um, high, high heats would, would be required for extended periods of time to kill hepatitis C virus. So it, it's important for us to be able to provide our communities with, with safe works and um, injection equipment if we are to reduce the transmission of hepatitis C among people who inject drugs. Next slide, please. However, we could do a better job with this. You can see on this slide that uh, syringe service programs are represented here on with the little triangles and each red dot is one hepatitis C case. And so 80% of people with hepatitis C live greater than 10 miles from a syringe service program with the median distance being 37 miles. So really we need to be thinking about how from a public health perspective we can be saturating our communities with clean syringes so that we can really stop the spread of hepatitis c and hiv of course next slide 
We know that treatment with hepatitis C can serve as prevention in similar ways as we've seen with HIV, except with hepatitis C. It's not just about getting to an undetectable viral load, it's about eliminating hepatitis C from the body. You cannot transmit an infection you no longer have. And so here is an example of uh, the impact of high hepatitis C treatment uptake on overall prevalence of hepatitis C RNA in the community. This data is from Australia. This is their annual needle syringe program survey. And what you can see here is that as the percent of eligible patients were treated from 2015 up to 2017, you see an overall decrease in the prevalence of HCV RNA among um, the population attending the needle and syringe program. So treatment as prevention is, um, it has been demonstrated in many places overseas and is certainly feasible. Next slide, please. So we know after cure, hepatitis C antibodies do not protect against reinfection. So this raises the concern for reinfection after somebody is cured, if they encounter the virus again. So that strategy of treatment as prevention is critical, making sure that we have harm reduction strategies, such as treating aggressively partners of people who have been treated before to reduce the risk of reinfection, and then access to clean syringes and, uh, and works is important as well. And then I think the last really critical thing to understand here is that we need patients to be able to access treatment both initially and for reinfection purposes. And there are significant barriers around the country to allow people who inject drugs in order to, to be able to be treated for hepatitis C. There are some Medicaid programs that still require patients to demonstrate sobriety from drugs and alcohol for set periods of time before they'll access treatment. Uh, and also individuals, if they do become reinfected, should have access to treatment for reinfection without stigma and discrimination. We really need to be reducing all the barriers as, po as much as possible in order to get individuals who use drugs into care and allow them to, uh, to be cured just the same way that individuals who um, do not use drugs have access to treatment. Next slide. Reinfection rates in general are pretty low. Uh, in methadone and buprenorphine programs, the rates are roughly 3.81 per year. And among individuals who have recently or continue to use injection drugs, the rates of reinfection are 5.86% per year. As unfortunate as reinfection is, I think we're, we need to assume that um, this is part of a public health endeavor. Just like when we treat somebody for syphilis once, it's not considered a, a, a failure if we have to treat them again um, for a new infection. It's part of what we do to take care of the whole patient. And similarly, for hepatitis C reinfection, we need to be able and be in a position to treat those patients without stigma, without judgment, and to be able to allow them to access harm reduction services so that the risk of their reinfection will be lower. Next slide, please. I wanna share with you a little bit about the work that we do at Philadelphia Fight Community Health Centers. We have a program called the See a Difference Program, which is really geared towards treating hepatitis C in people who use drugs. We have a community-based testing program, which really is focused on partnering with both inpatient and outpatient substance use disorder treatment programs. We work with homeless shelters, as well as the Philadelphia Department of Prisons. Our testing protocol really focuses on supporting the integration of confirmatory testing via policy work. And so very recently within um, our uh, substance use disorder treatment programs, reflexive hepatitis C testing is now covered as part of the annual antibody screen in our prison system, which is really a misnomer. It's a large city jail. They now, screen everybody on intake for hepatitis C with a reflex to confirmatory testing. In places where there isn't routine blood work done, we do utilize point of care antibody testing with an immediate blood draw 
for an RNA test by our community-based testers. And then we've implemented some pretty significant uh, protocols to make sure that all of our patients who receive care in any of our primary care clinics are screened for hepatitis C as appropriate. Next slide. One of the things that is a hallmark of our programs at Philadelphia Fight is a multidisciplinary huddle. And so we come together with both our community partners as well as our staff on site. We do so weekly in order to make sure that we're facilitating warm handoffs and exchange of information to support patients that historically our healthcare system has failed to engage successfully. We have a patient navigation model uh, where care is not yet embedded and we make sure we get all the contact information we can I mentioned we use our huddles. We try to reduce as many barriers as we possibly can with open scheduling and walk-in hours. We have a mobile fiber scan that we bring to different sites, including the, the prison, so that people can be staged immediately. The nice thing about working for a federally qualified health center is that we can take care of patients without insurance and without a referral. We help with transportation, uh, as well as people's emergency and uh, priority needs, such as food, blankets, and shoes. And we use a modified DOT model where it's appropriate. So for patients that don't feel comfortable keeping their medication on them because of unstable housing, we will hold their medicine for them and, um, and support them around dispensing. And we will go wherever we need to go in the city to draw uh, what is called an SVR check, sustained virologic response, which is an assessment for cure, which measures the absence of virus in the blood 12 weeks after you complete treatment. And I think there isn't much that's uh, been positive that's come out of our COVID-19 pandemic, but what I will say is that necessity is the mother of invention and, and the use of telehealth and overcoming many of these barriers to hepatitis C treatment has been significant. Our ability to bring more and more treatment to where the patient is rather than requiring them to navigate to us has really been quite revolutionary. Next slide, please. So I just want to show you this quick data. These are the impact of simple EMR modifications on our testing rates. When my team and I arrived at Philadelphia Fight, we uh, went from screening about 40% of our patients annually for hepatitis C up to 90%. Next slide. And this is uh, one example of an ongoing uh, cascade of care that we have for our community and clinic-based cl based, uh, testing and treatment programs. So I just want to give you a sense here that it is really important when you build these models of care to measure them regularly. So we look at our cascade of care almost on a weekly basis. And this is an example of one that compares how we do in our primary care practices. So where we've tested individuals and started them in care, when they've come in, obviously our linkage to care and cure rates are significantly higher than individuals that we have found in the community and have not been engaged in a typical healthcare setting. We have to work harder to overcome some of those barriers, uh, which we're always trying to evolve and, and be better in. Next slide. So in conclusion, uh, system site and provider-based barriers have often negatively impacted efforts with HCV diagnosis and treatment. In federally qui qualified health centers, there are EMR modifications, provider education and workflow modifications with really attention to patient adherence support that can result in improved outcomes. And monitoring your care continuum in each setting with ongoing quality improvement is really necessary for HCV elimination. And I think really key, particularly for those of us in the US, de-siloing our physical and behavioral health care really has to occur in order to facilitate incorporation of HCV services, uh, particularly for people who use drugs. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Truskin. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Coleman Terrell, Director of the AIDS Activities Coordinating Office at the Philadelphia Department of Health. Mr. Terrell has directed multiple Ryan White HIV AIDS program grants including a recent special projects of national significance project 
titled Jurisdictional Approach to Curing Hepatitis C Among HIV HCV Co-Infected People of Color. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Terrell. Hello, um, thank you for having me. Um, I will focus my talk on Philadelphia's response to an HIV outbreak among people who inject drugs and the theme of meeting people where they are. Next slide. So to start off, I wanna disclose my perspective. I'm responsible um, for the oversight of HIV care prevention and surveillance grants funded with a range of federal, state, and local funds. Um, I'm not a direct care provider, but I work to develop systems and structures that are implemented through 50 provider organizations. Um, next slide. So when we think about um, meeting people where they are, um, here are some of the important considerations for people who inject drugs in Philadelphia. Um, they're living in a syndemic of substance use, opioid overdose, HIV, HCV, hepatitis A, and STIs. They're in a city with a well-established services and systems in place. People are located in specific geographic areas. Um, Kensington is a focus in Philadelphia. People have self-identified needs that may and probably differ from our public health identified needs. They're affected by poverty and lack of housing, and they're in a community context that may or may not be supportive of providing care. I will be talking about how these factors have impacted our response to the HIV outbreak. Next slide. So in this graph, you can see the um, number of newly diagnosed HIV uh, cases among people who inject drugs from 1983. Uh, syringe exchange was um, instituted in 1992 by mayoral executive order. And um, newly diagnosed HIV among people who inject drugs have steadily fallen until 2016. And then there's been a, an increase in um, recent years. Next slide. So from the low point of 33 cases in 2016, we've seen an increase of 148% um, from 2016 to 2019 in the number of cases of HIV among people who inject drugs. Next slide. So this just gives um, some idea of the situation in Philadelphia. We're in the midst of an opioid crisis and overdose epidemic. The situation for people who inject drugs is severe. In the graph on the left, you can see increases in unintentional overdoses rising through 2017 and now at a plateau. And on the right, there's local data from National HIV Behavioral Surveillance Project looking at people who inject drugs. And it's indicated high rates of overdose, lack of access to medication assisted treatment and high rates of transactional sex. Next slide. So, since we identified this outbreak um, at the end of 2019, we had a transmission network that included 320 people. Um, these are people with related um, infections. Um, and what is notable about that, I mean, some of it's um, not surprising, but we have a significant number of men who have sex with men. 23% um, of the total outbreak transmission network are men who have sex with men and 12% are um, MSM IDU. Um, in addition, there are very high rates of HCV. The 51% is probably very low. That's HCV at the time of diagnosis. Um, and um, so this is sort of a look at the cases that we're um, investigating. Next slide. So we began outbreak response planning prior to the identification of the outbreak. Um, and this involved cross-departmental coordination um, with hepatitis C programs, the substance use programs, um, and the um, STD programs. Um, we developed a data sharing and analysis plan. We had started a syringe access work group um, and developed a set of care and treatment one-stop shops that could be mobilized in the event of an outbreak. I'll talk about them in a bit. Um, key elements of the outbreak plan we were developing were to use data to drive interventions, such as using partner services staff to find and link people to care, and to mobilize already established one-stop shops to, that treat HIV and provide PrEP to partner, partners, treat HCV and provide substance use disorder treatment and supportive services. Um, this really follows the pillars of the ending the HIV epidemic approach, diagnose, treat, and prevent. Next slide. So our outbreak response plan was not yet complete when the HIV outbreak was identified, um, but we were able, able to rapidly implement a number of steps. 
Um, we implemented a communication plan to inform providers, um, the public, and the um, community of people who inject drugs. Um, we mobilized HIV testing resources into the areas of need. Um, we enhanced partner services in the area. Um, we mobilized our one-stop shops. We called them together and explained what was going on to mobilize them. Um, we developed a significant expansion of syringe services programs. Um, we built a stronger collaboration with HIV surveillance and the city jail. Um, we had coordination with the city and public health department responses to the opioid crisis. And we consulted with other jurisdictions um, experiencing um, outbreaks of HIV among people who inject drugs. And we've done ongoing review and evaluation of the response and developing new approaches as we move along. Next slide. So I wanna talk a bit about communications issues in our response. Um, so HIV outbreak is happening in the midst of multiple public health issues focused in the Kensington neighborhood. There are multiple and competing messages from the health department, messages about overdose reversal, about the HIV outbreak, about prevention and treatment, about HCV testing and cure, about social services and housing, especially related to um, clearing encampments of people experiencing homelessness, substance use disorder treatment access, a hepatitis A outbreak, flu immunization, and community safety concerns. So the HIV outbreak is perhaps insignificant to compared to many of the other issues facing people in Kensington. And when every message is urgent, there's a question of how we can effectively communicate. The response had to be coordinated across many silos of funding, local response structures, and organizations serving the population. Next slide. So we needed to increase efforts to diagnose HIV among people who inject drugs, and we were able to mobilize increased community testing for HIV, but the majority of new diagnoses were in, occurred in clinical settings and emergency departments and in the city jail system. The jail system has routine HIV screening at intake. And even with multiple prison linkage programs, including the use of partner services staff, there's still many missed opportunities to connect people to care upon release. To increase testing in emergency departments, the Philadelphia Department of Public Health conducted presentations to area emergency departments on the need to test people who inject drugs for HIV, HCV, STIs, and the department offered linkage support, which was a concern in these emergency department programs. Um, and then recently, more recently, there's been a significant reduc reduction in both community-based and clinical testing due to COVID. Next slide. So this outbreak occurred despite having a large local syringe service program, which in 2018 distributed 3.3 million syringes to 14,000 unique exchangers. Um, according to the local national HIV behavioral surveillance um, program, more than one in four um, people who inject drugs reported using a syringe after someone else used it, and people are injecting at a higher rate due frequency due to the presence of fentanyl in the drug supply. The main brick and mortar location for the syringe service program is well situated in Kensington, but the mobile sites around the city had not been realigned in recent times, and there are significant gaps in coverage. And the emerging population of people who inject drugs in Philadelphia has been younger, um, and there's increasing substance use in MSM communities. And all of these, these have all created a need to look at options to expand syringe service programs. So in Philadelphia, next slide, um, we have um, readjusted times and locations of syringe service mobile sites based on fatal overdose data. Um, we have increased funds for, for the syringe service program. Um, we aim to double the number of syringes distributed. And we have found funding um, and a partner to build capacity and stabilize the lo local syringe service program um, with the goal of actually um, transferring that technology to increase numbers of providers um, providing syringe service um, activities. And we've also been considering alternative means of syringe access through pharmacies, through clinical sites, um, through harm reduction vending machines, um, which have been used in Las Vegas, and developing a safe injection facility. But for all of these efforts, there are significant challenges related to a community engagement and local politics. Next slide. So I wanna talk about an example of one of our plans to expand access to syringes, um, the use of harm reduction vending machines. Um, these could 
machines can have a variety of syringes and works, naloxone, safer sex kits, and other items, and would be located in a community site that it would expand access in a potentially less stigmatizing way than a mobile exchange site. So our first effort in Philadelphia has been, find a, has been to find a, a location to provide access to gay and bisexual men who might not otherwise engage in a syringe services program. And our steps to implementation as we began to discuss this included a long range of people we needed to get buy-in from, the executive staff, the board of directors, organization donors. I hadn't thought about that when we went into the meeting, but it's um, organizational donors may not want to um, have syringe service activities in their um, organizations, um, neighborhoods, neighbors, and politicians. And we had just begun this process with the local organization um, when COVID activities interrupted the process. So we'll be taking that up again. Next slide. So one of our key approaches to our outbreak response was to um, treat and prevent HIV, HCV through um, one-stop shops. These are care sites that can provide a comprehensive array of services to people who are living with or at risk for HIV or hepatitis C and their partners and families all in one location. Um, we surveyed sites and identified nine sites in Philadelphia that met these criteria and were willing to be mobilized in our initial outbreak planning. Next slide. So the one-stop shop services include, we looked for places that could provide all of these services, HIV tre treatment, PrEP, PEP, hepatitis C treatment, MAT, naloxone distribution, screening referrals, or provision of support services, insurance navigation, and medical case management. Next slide. So we looked at the outcomes in our one-stop shops, and um, these are outcomes for four of the providers involved in responding to this outbreak. Um, and in the blue columns on the left, you'll see retention and care. And on the, the um, orange on the right, you'll see viral suppression. And you can see that retention and care and viral suppression vary considerably, but they clearly need improvement in the existing infrastructure if treatment is to be an effective approach to stopping the outbreak. Next slide. So as our team looked at the data, we noticed that there are many people in the network who are cycling in and out of different provider sites. And I'm gonna give you a brief description of one such case. So the patient was identified as being in a highly connected network. The diagnosis occurred in 2016 at an HIV care facility in Philadelphia. Seven months later, uh, viral load testing happened um, at a different Philadelphia care facility. And then there was follow-up. Um, the patient tested positive for syphilis at a different, at another facility in 2018, was referred to the emergency department for treatment, and there's no additional evidence of follow-up as of um, January 20th of 2020. Um, partner services didn't follow up on this patient because um, there was a previous out-of-jurisdiction address, although it's very clear this person is in Philadelphia and going from provider site to provider site. Next slide. So another issue is that identified one-stop shops were not in the right locations. None were directly in the Kensington area of Philadelphia, the center of the outbreak. Um, there are significant care and prevention silos in the area. All of the one-stop shop services are needed, but the identified one-stop shops are not optimally accessible to that area. These services in the area are siloed by disease conditions, funding streams, days of availability, and multiple provider organizations. In the syringe service program, some seven organizations are providing services with multiple electronic health records, um, which syringe service program case managers can't access. There are multiple health department programs addressing the same people with different messages and services at this site. And so our vision is to move this siloed system to a person-centered, low threshold, full service site in the syringe service program in Kensington. Next slide. So we look at some of our local successes and um, we had outbreak planning before the outbreak um, was noticed. So we had connections and conversations already occurring in the health department. We were able to build on and mobilize an existing system of testing HIV care and prevention, including well-established testing in the city jails. Through the SPENS project mentioned at the beginning, um, to cure co-infected individuals. We've overcome some silos, both in the health department and in our provider network, and we've increased the overall capacity to treat HCV in Philadelphia. 
We were able to develop a public-private partnership to significantly expand resources for an organizational support for syringe service programs. And we have incorporated the development of a new low threshold, high support, one-stop shop, including non-HIV services into local ending the HIV epidemic planning. And we've now started the implementation of this effort at the local syringe service program with um, HRSA EHE funding. Next slide. So the lessons we've learned, um, one is that your existing capacity may be in wrong locations. Um, we were sort of um, felt assured when we started that we weren't starting from zero, but um, uh, location is everything. Um, existing capacity can be overwhelmed. In Philadelphia, that was with fentanyl, with COVID, with encampment clearance, all of these um, added to um, the outbreak of HIV. Um, harm reduction approaches must balance many competing needs, which may not be felt by people we are serving as needs. Um, partner services staff need to be supplemented with specialized field services staff for linkage and re-engagement and care. And funding systems do not support collaboration and integration of services. And ongoing um, work to overcome community concerns about the placement of public health programs is an ongoing issue. Um, thank you. Next slide. I want to acknowledge um, my ACO staff and PDPH colleagues and funding from both HRSA and CDC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Terrell. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Kathy Fowles. Ms. Fowles is a licensed practical nurse and infectious disease coordinator at Recovery Network of Programs, a private nonprofit social service agency which has been serving the greater Bridgeport, Connecticut community since 1972. Kathy and her team at RNP is a participating site and subrecipient to Yale University on HRSA HABs curing hepatitis C among people of color living with HIV cooperative agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Fowles. Thank you so much for having me. Next slide. I will be talking today um, on the work that we have, we have started and hopefully will continue for many years to come. We are Recovery Network of Programs, a private not-for-profit social service agency serving the greater Bridgeport area since 1972. Our mission is to restore hope, health, and well-being for individuals and families in a recovery environment that embraces compassion, dignity, and respect. Next slide. Our clients, today we're gonna to serve, we're gonna talk about our methadone, uh, our medication assisted treatment program clients, clients or the MAP programs. It's a population at risk for HIV, HCV, STIs, tuberculosis, overdose, mental health and co-occurring disorders, unstable housing and living conditions, unemployment and irregular employment, medication adherence challenges. In the year 2000, we had approximately 360 clients. Today, we have 1,690 clients. It's a huge expansion. The presentation focus today is on HIV and HCV. Next slide. Prior to April of 2019, um, our admissions um, protocol was mandatory blood work. We had CBC and RPR, AST and ALT. We had opt out HIV and hepatitis C testing via the rapid testing route, which is antibody only, and a separate consent form was required. Clients could also request an HIV or HCV rapid antibody tests anytime while receiving RNP services. So you can see in the graph that from January of 2018 to March of 2019, there weren't many tests done. There were approximately 32% um, of the clients were tested for HIV and 18% were tested for uh, hepatitis C. Next slide. Project 
Conquer Hep C. What is it? Project Conquer Hep C is the Connecticut Quantification Evaluation and Response for HIV, HCV elimination in persons of color. It's funded by HRSA SPINS to address the racial disparities in access to HIV, HCV treatment for co-infected individuals. The project partners are the Connecticut DPH. Um, they have surveillance data and the disease intervention specialist. We have the clinic partners. There are 11 multi-site evaluation clinics. We have the syringe programs and the substance use disorder programs, and there are six of us. The training comes from AET, and they have training for clients, non-clinical providers, and clinical providers, and the project ECHO, CHC, which is provider focused. Next slide. When we became involved with um, Conquer was October of 2018. The RNP administration decided that they would um, partner with Conquer Hep C. In December of 2018, the clinical champion for Conquer was specified. And that person um, does the ECHO meetings and the monthly meetings. The Conquer champions, all of the partners identified, um, talked about the testing barriers and this was done by nominal group technique. In January of 2019, the Conquer partners issued recommendations for improved testing at SUD SSP sites. In March of 2019, RNP administration released updated procedures and protocols to improve HIV HCV diagnosis in clients based on the project recommendations. And then in April of 2019, the clinical champion included bundled HIV HCV testing as part of routine admission blood work. Clients can still opt out, but few do. The testing uptake increased immensely. Next slide. So the recommendations um, that were, were found. In the NGT session with Dr. Rick Altis in December of 2018, the participants voted on a couple of questions. Um, the first question was, what gets in the way of doing routine HCV screening? And the most answers on that was lack of bundled testing. The second question, what would need to change in your organizational setting to implement routine HCV screening? And that one was comprehensive HCV screening and referral protocol, something needed to be put into place. Next screen, please. So the Conquer Hep C recommendations were um, improved HCV testing protocol for the SUD SSP clinics. So testing needed to be part and parcel of all intakes. It needed to have an automatic checkbox for ordering on lab slips. And it allowed for bundled order sets with reflex PCR testing. Then we needed to communicate the test results and to facilitate linkage for further management. Next slide. So HCV, HIV testing rates for January 2018 to March 2020. So the mean value before the policy change, there were monthly clients of 112. Mean HIV testing was 13%. The mean HCV testing was 5%. And in April of 2019, the mean values went up to monthly clients were 77. The mean HIV testing was 92%. And the mean, the mean HIV testing, excuse me, was 92%. And the mean HCV testing was 89%. Next slide. These, this resulted in improved diagnosis. So the total Totals before the policy changes, we had no positive HIV results. 
the positive hepatitis C antibody results were zero. Positive hepatitis C PCR results were zero. So consequently, there were no HIV, HCV co-infected persons that were identified. So after the policy change, we had positive HIV, result, HIV results of 17. We had positive hepatitis C antibody results of 292 with positive HCV PCRs of 128. And we identified seven HIV, HCV co-infected clients. And if you look at the graph, you can see the, how, how that policy change just changed everything in this clinic. Next slide, please. So our revised protocol when it comes to the testing is clients who test positive for HIV, they're given their results and set up the same day or the next day with the medical provider if needed. Clients who test positive for hepatitis C antibody with a positive PCR are seen and given the results. Referrals are given for hepatitis C treatment with a follow-up appointment in six weeks. And those with no current medical provider are referred to a new one. Clients who test positive for hepatitis C antibody with a negative PCR are also seen. They are asked if they had treatment when the treatment was and what the medication was. They are congratulated for staying hepatitis C free after treatment. Many did not know that they had the HCV antibody and cleared it themselves. So we go over the risks and the transmission so that they can remain hepatitis C free. Next slide, please. Administration partnered with, the local, with a local clinic to have an on-site satellite clinic come into the um, MAT clinic. So after April of 2019, the real changes came in client conversations. Knowing that they have HCV with a confirmatory PCR um, that conf confirmed active in infection makes it real for the clients. They now understand that something needs to be done. The certainty of existing hepatitis C infection opens the door for treatment discussions. Hepatitis C is now included in the client's RNP treatment plan in their electronic health record. Um, we have follow-up appointments and discussions and having the PCR results improves connections with the outside providers. Outside providers just don't want to hear that it was a positive antibody test. Next slide. The engagement results of 927 clients admitted to the methadone assisted treatment program from April of 2019 to March 2020, 842 were tested for HIV and 812 for hepatitis C antibody. 292 had PCRs. In the HIV engagement, 17 positive cases were identified. All 17 previously knew that they were HIV positive. Six of those were new disclosures to the methadone program. 15 were already actively in care. Two had been in care previously but had stopped, and these two were re-engaged with their physicians due to this testing. In the HCV engagement, 128 positive antibody with positive PCR. 97 previously knew that they were HCV positive, 16 of those were already in treatment. There were 31 new diagnoses. 52 referrals were made to new providers. 22 were lost to follow-up. And six new treatment starts um, happened due to this testing. Next slide. In conclusion, client care is improved by inclusion of standard HIV HCV testing. Bundling of HIV, HCV testing with other intake blood work increases the likelihood of uptake. HCV testing with P 
PCR has allowed for treatment and cure of previously undiagnosed clients, both mono-infected and co-infected. And administration and clinical champions are critical for successful implementation and adoption of the revised policies by staff and clients. Next slide. These are my acknowledgments. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Fowles. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. If you would like to receive continuing education credit for this activity, please visit the link on the uh, slide shown here, which is ryanwhite.cds.pesgce.com. We now invite you to join today's presenters for a live Q&A session. Thank you.